Hi everyone, welcome to Lurking for Legends. We're a live video cast that speaks to people from all works of the publishing world with the aim of getting our guests a little bit more exposure in the tough world of publishing. My hosts, Christy Stratus and Richard H. Stevens, and myself encourage viewers to chime in with questions for our guests or simply comment on what you hear. As you can see, we are down at Christy Stratus tonight and I haven't got my wig with me so I can't fill in for her. Something came up last minute for Christy, so I'm afraid you're stuck with just me and Richard tonight. Tonight on Lurking for Legends, we're excited to be speaking with multi-talented author Dario Aguilar Peregrina. Welcome, Dario. Thank you, David, for having me. Thank you, Richard, uh, again. Welcome. For you're welcome. So before we get started with, with asking a few questions and, and so on, why don't you just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and what you do? Okay, well, I'm a 25-year-old writer from Mexico City, and I usually write different themes such as sports, action, LGBT themes, and also music, because in Latin America, I think we love a lot of music. Mm. So you, you write stories about music, is that correct? It's correct, and also I prefer to create action ones. Inspired mm -hmm. by movies such as The Dark Knight from Christopher Nolan, also 28 Days Later from Danny Boyle. Mm -hmm. And another inspiration, I think, is the Disney Pixar movies, because my mom always put me that when I was a kid. And also because of Disney, I learned to speak English, so it's a connection since oh, I wow. was cool. very young. And did you say you're 25? 25, you're, Richard. 25. 25 and... We'll get into all this other stuff that you do as the show goes on, but that's incredible that you're doing all this stuff and you're only 25. Like, that's <laughs> yeah, great. everybody tell, tells me that every day. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty incredible. Um, so, um, from what I understand, you started writing very early, I believe, at the age of six. Is that correct? Uh, it's correct. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about how that came about? Of course, David. Well, everything started when my grandpa, who was a poet, uh, showed me his work. And I decided to present that for my school. And I remember presenting one of his poems in front of my classes, uh, classmates. And there was also a, a contest. And I remember that I got into second place because I laughed at the last minute in front of everyone. So I got in the second place at the end. But I wanted to write more. And I told my grandpa, hey, what about if I create more poems like you? And he told me, OK, you are free to do it. And I started writing poems. But my poems uh, started to be like narratives. And I told later my, my grandpa, okay, my poems are not as good as yours. I'm going to prefer to create stories, short stories, or other things that are more action packed. And then uh, my mom always, when she has the, had the opportunity, she always said to me, okay, let's go to the movies and watch whatever movie it's right now, no? And I remember watching a lot of Atlantis movies. I remember going to see Shrek when I was three years old. So <laughs> it was a real nice experience. And other stories I started to watch, no? such as Spider-Man and also other, other Disney movies. And then I decided to create more and more stories based on what I, see, I was seeing. And then I remember there was a contest in my school about the from about from writing short stories, no. I remember writing a fan fiction of Bambi. I remember, <laughs> <laughs> and in my classroom, they told me, "Hey, your your writing is really great. You should really focus yourself in into that." But I thought I don't think I'm not that good. So, but uh, but at the end. I decided to create more stories. And I remember one night, one night especially, uh, there was a huge, a huge uh, story in the news 
of the hurricane season that was coming in 2005. Mm -hmm. I was eight years old in that in that in that year, and I told my mom, "Hey, what is the hurricane stem all about?" And I borrowed a book from my uh, teachers, and I started reading them, and I decided to create a story about hurricanes. So uh, then, uh, a few months later, uh, I saw the movie The Day After Tomorrow uh, by Roland Emmerich, and I got really inspired because there was a specific scene that really got into me. First, the natural disasters that were happening in the movie. Also, there was the time where the American people wanted to refugee in Mexico. So I got really interested into that and I told to myself, okay, what about if we create a story about American people and Mexican people? It would be a really nice combination, but with a touch of action like superheroes. Mm -hmm. um, that night I had a dream of me fighting a hurricane. And in the next morning, I decided to write that story and I remember in the news again, they announced the Hurricanes 2007 season is coming. So that name struck into me and I decided to create my story where I, when I was nine years old, titled Hurricanes 2007. And then it started, I started writing other, other chapters of the story. And then I, re I realized that I could write a, a novel. Uh, I don't know. For example, do you remember there was this twilight um, craze in back in late in the late 20, 2000s, in the late 2000s? And I decided, okay, my classmates are really excited for these stories. Also, Harry Potter uh, was finishing his its movies, and I wanted to to do that. Also, I decided to create a saga inspired by those movies and also by Star Wars because I was a big fan of Star Wars, superhero movies. Iron Man in 2008, I went to see it when I was 30 years old. So I really got into writing because of that things. And at the end, well, I think it worked. And the first book of Hurricanes 2007, I published it back in 2019. This is the first book. This is the title in Spanish. And I remember writing the book very patiently, but <laughs> I remember also because I was um, I was coming from my major of, of law in Mexico. Uh, my story at the beginning it was like a a plaintiff, <laughs> so I decided to change some things, and at the end the story worked, and also I got to translate it into English. That sounds incredible. Uh, so a, little, a comment here from Hillary. She says, it must be fantastic to dream up your plot. I actually can understand that because um, when I'm writing, quite often I actually dream up sections of my my books and even entire endings sometimes. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's an incredible feeling when you can do that, for sure. Of course, it was a really nice experience. And also because... That dream also opening, opened me the possibilities of more stories. So many more stories came the next few years. And also I went to see more movies and write more and, and more stories came. <laughs> <laughs> so you were saying that book that you just showed us uh, is in Spanish. Do you publish in both Spanish and English? Yes, Richard, I publish it both because in my home, con in my home country, I remember pitching the, the book to the to the big uh, editorials and they told me, okay, your story is really good. You have really nice characters, a great plot, but we don't think it's going to work here in Mexico because right now in Mexico, we want more stories about um, non-fiction things. And they don't, didn't want to hear a, a fiction action stories so a science fiction story so i got really disappointed for that 
and I decided to translate it into English. And then in Twitter, uh, many writing community members, uh, hello to Titi Banks, Mario Del Olio, AC Merkel, hello Scott, Stacy Cox also from North Carolina, who really, who really supported me in my journey. And they shared part of my work. And they and many people started to me to reaching to me and told me, okay, your story is really good. Why in Mexico they didn't accept that? And I told to them, I don't know, maybe because it was too much action. I don't know. <laughs> but I I think many people I want to thank to them because they really uh, helped me in my journey and also because writing in Spanish and English is really, really different. In Spanish, mm -hmm. you write more about the character. In English, mm -hmm. you want to tell more about the development of the story. It's different, but at the same time, similar. So mm -hmm. it was a really, a really challenging uh, thing to do. Isn't that interesting? I would never think that. I'd my my only question was uh, so how do you know? I, I know you 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 uh, speak English quite well, but you know, doing the the written language is sometimes, especially English. Is, English is such a beast because uh, there's so many words that mean so many different things, and you know mm. if that's not your native tongue, to actually translate your Spanish uh, rendition into English to make it sound the way you had it sounding in Spanish. How do you go about that? Did you actually do that yourself, or do you have someone else do that for you just to check it anyway? All by myself, Richard. All by myself. I did all by myself. And also in the second story uh, that already is published in English, call it Hurricanes 2007, The Climatic Crisis. Uh, the second story, I really got help from my friends that I already mentioned because they give me a lot of feedback. They gave me a lot of feedback uh, because I remember in the first book, you can see it, people, in, in Amazon. The first book, I remember one review that one people, one, one girl left and she told me, okay, your story is really great, but you are dragging in some sentences and also you need to uh, improve a lot of your... A, other, another words to, to make it work. So I got really I got really into that message and I decided to pray, uh, to perfect the next story and then it really got uh, it really got nice the story. <laughs> I'm amazed because I, English is my only language and I still struggle to write it. So for you to do Spanish <laughs> and English, I think that's amazing. So mm. kudos to you. I just want to put this comment in here from another viewer. It says, love this so much. Great enthusiasm and talent, Daryl. And that's, that's so true. And again, I, I'm just uh, I'm mesmerized that you're only 25 and you've done all this. <laughs> and not only do you write, but you also, uh, sorry, I've got this written down here and I'm just going to scroll down to it. Uh, you uh, are also a radio program, you host a radio program called Liter Literatura Actual. And I imagine that's based in Mexico City, correct? No, it's based on Quebec, Canada. Oh, really? It's, yes, yes, it's really because one of my friends uh, in my writing journey, when I was growing as a writer, uh, she is Graciela Chawe. Uh, she's one of my mentors. Uh, I remember last year when I won the Jota Award in Mexico City because of my writing, uh, she told me, uh, would you like to host a radio program for a Latin, a Latin Canadian uh, uh, people, or would you like also to to share your your thoughts on writing in a call in the newspaper? And I told her yes, why not? And I became the host of today's literature that I usually share excerpts of some books. It doesn't matter if they are in Spanish or English. I already mentioned some of my American friends or, or British friends' it works. So if you want people, uh, Richard, uh, uh, David, if you want to have a, a shout out in the program, don't worry. Just tell me, Dario, could you mention my books in your program? And don't worry. It's going to be for the Latin, Latin Canadian audience. And many people can hear more about your work, not only the the English speakers, also mm -hmm. the Latin speakers. 
That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, thank you. So, and also, uh, I work, I collaborate in another magazine right now in South America. It's called uh, Relatos Esmeraldeños in Spanish, but in English it would be Esmer Emerald Stories. It's from a city from Ecuador, and I normally collaborate there, there so I can talk about the new boom of, of the literature world here in Hispanic America, because right now, many young writers like me and other people here in Latin America, we want a new boom in the literature, in the literature world, because we want more stories heard, about, heard around the world. And also because I think many of my generation uh, grew up with a lot of American content, uh, British content. So right now, I think we have this combination of our Latin culture and the American culture, so or the Canadian culture. So it's nice to see to see many people like me writing these stories and really be passionate about. So we've got a, a comment from uh, Wanda. She says, "Wow, good for you. That, that is true dedication and very inspiring." Thank you, Wanda. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, for sure. So that other magazine you're talking about, uh, there, I also see there's a Latin Canadian magazine. Hello, Arte. Is am I saying that right? Like yes. I have trouble with English, so <laughs> I'm trying to do something else. And did you say that uh, the literature actual is actually based in Quebec? Yes, yes. Uh, it's because my friend she lives in Quebec. She produces all the work there. I normally send her the programs. In, uh, I normally her send her the programs in WhatsApp. And she broadcast, broadcasts that, or re, there's another word. Uh, she shares, she shares again the programs that I normally uh, put in the radio, and she really knows how to do that. And also, she has the other magazine called Hello Arte. Hello Arte is also a magazine where we showcase many talents from around the world. And if you want, Richard, again, David, uh, <laughs> if you want to be included in the magazine, of course, you want, if you can. So only tell me, Dario, this is the story I would like to share. And we will, we will share it in the magazine. The next magazine is coming on September, I think. Well, we'll have to take you up on that because if you're from Mexico City, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but Mexico City's population is probably a quarter of Canada's entire population. <laughs> Mexico is a very, very big city, and I, I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Uh, what is the population of Mexico City? Ah, uh, the population of Mexico City, I think, is 120 million people. 120 million? So well, it's twice, as, twice the size of Canada. Then. Oh, wow. Holy cow. Yeah, so, so we definitely have to break the Mexico time, City market for sure. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's all I have to do. I just have to write for Mexico City, and I'm I've got it made. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all of my, all of my stories and all of the things I normally write about, it's about the connection between Mexico City and other parts of the world. In this case, I told you uh, I got this connection with the American Canadian uh, people since I was really young because my mom always, even if she cannot speak sp uh, English. Well, she always tried to to help me to to improve my my language so I could communicate with others and also to pitch projects because I would love in the future uh, one of my books to be turned into a movie. Uh, mm -hmm. About speaking about other books, I have also this this book. It's called The Three Wise Young Men. Uh, the Three Wise Young Men is a holiday a 10 book because as you know santa claus santa claus brings the gifts to the children in around the world but in latin america especially here in mexico we have the tradition that three three wizards came to our houses every january 6th in the evening and they bring mm -hmm. in and they bring a lot of gifts so i wanted to put that in this story because for example, when you want to send a letter to Santa, you always write it, and I don't know if you send it to the mail or I don't know. 
Here in Mexico City, we normally put the letter in a balloon and send it to the sky. It's a really nice tradition every every January 6th. Uh, my mom always wanted to me to, to have that tradition. And I remember having a good time because that day I remember in the in the Alameda Central is a place here in Mexico City. It's a plaza. Uh, there is normally a fair. So many children went, want to, to buy some toys and also buy food, no? And many want to take a picture with the three wise men, so to the three, with the three wizards and Santa Claus. So it's a really nice mix between the American culture, the Canadian culture, and Mexican culture. So it's, it's really nice. So you mentioned, Dario, that uh, some of the characters in your books have been based on yourself. And I understand that you also um, base some of them on friends and relatives. So I was kind of wondering, it's like, do you actually tell them that you're basing them on them or do you let them find out for themselves when they read the book? <laughs> mm, I, every, every character that I wrote, as you, saw, as you told, David, uh, it's really based on, on one of the of my family members or friends. When they read that, they really get really happy because they said, "Oh, you wrote about me, and and I got to be in this in this story." So they really love that. They uh, any uh, there's nobody that uh, that already told me, "Okay, you wrote about me, and I'm really angry." No, everybody is loving to be mentioned in my books, and, and I, it's really nice. <laughs> That's terrific. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'd get away with that with my family and friends. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Daryl kills his characters off, though, Dave. Yeah, that's the trouble with my books. They tend to have a pretty high body count. <laughs> ah, no. No, for example, David, for example, David, in Hurricane Studio 7, I really got a really big body count because it's a really action packed story mm -hmm. in the first book the first book i remember it was a little bit criticized because there was a lot of deaths in the first story in the second one there's not a lot but in the third one that is titled the virus of extermination you have zombies you have this hurricane like uh, people uh, also you have the protagonist and you see a lot of deaths. So it, I normally try to do different things in all my stories. Hurricanes is more for a mature audience. The Three Wiz Young Men is more for a family audience. And mm -hmm. right now I'm playing other two books that are, that are also a family theme or, or general audience theme. Title uh, Brigade DXT, the story about the story of a uh, a Mexican kid and his friends trying to get into the Olympic Games. It, it will be a trilogy. Also, Latin dancing. Latin dancing is the story of a girl that gets into a video game of the same name. And she and her friends are going to, to win a tournament, need to win a tournament so they can uh, win the money and be the next stars of the Latin music uh, of Latin music. Hmm. That's awesome. So you got four books out right now? Uh, four books right now. Uh, Richard, this is the, for children, this is the latest. And the three books, Hurricanes 1, Hurricanes 2, and Hurricanes 3. And that, pardon the pun, but that blows me away. You have four books out already, and you're 25. I'm I'm just wondering, listening to your energy and everything else, like uh, CJ said, that uh, what what do you foresee in Dario's future five years from now? I I really what I told you. I would love to see my work adapted into a movie, into a series. Uh, I would love to have more. Uh, presentations around the world. Right now, I'm going to have one in one of my uh, of one of my friends' cities. I'm going to present my books this Saturday at 5 p.m. 
And in Canada, well, my friend uh, Graciela wants to me to to present some books for the for the for the Latin public, and also I would love to for the Canadian people. I would love to to do it. Uh, also, congratulations, Richard. I I saw that you are going to present your books in the Canadian Expo. I think yes, yes. Congratulations again. No, and and also I would love to to travel more, to travel more, to to present my stories and give more talks to the children uh, so they can write stories just like me as uh, as I was a, a child when that I was dreaming. No? So I think I have more, a lot of plans. Sorry, because I'm bubbling a lot. No, no worries. I'm not, I'm not, not like, I not, I normally don't, uh, <laughs> talk like this when I'm speaking English, but I really, I'm really excited for for this. <laughs> no, that's great. No, this show's all about you, Dario. So you be bubbly all you want. <laughs> so I, I spotted on on your Twitter feed um, that um, last year you received a very special award. Would you like to tell us something about that? Of course, David. Well. It was a, actually this year. This year, actually, it was. Oh, sorry, this year. But in the last year, I'm going to tell you all the story. First, I won the Queer India Awards uh, from this organization, Queer Indie. Queer Indie is an organization based in the United States that is from my friends uh, Mario Delolio and Titi Banks and Halo Scott. And they invited me to participate in this uh, people voting contests and I won and I won the award the the inaugural award because many people love it my story and in the next few months I won the Jout award in my city the Jout award is normally awarded to all uh, people aged from 10 years old to 29 years old so I won in the category of uh, artistic merit so it was really really nice and then in these months, I won the Arts Medal in the in Mexico City's Congress. I got to speak in front of the deputies of my of my of my city. If you want to see it, it's in your, it's on YouTube. My uh, my speech, and it was really nice because I was the youngest winner of that medal at 24 years old. So it was it was really nice. Wow! Congratulations. Mm, that's awesome. That's amazing. And right now, there's another contest that I want to, to participate. It's the National Jolt Award uh, because the last year I won the Mexico City one, the state, the state all. And now I want to win the national because it would be really nice to represent Mexico City in this against other states of my country. So I, I want to win that. Uh, the award is going to be on December, but right now they are uh, they are still waiting to to put the the letter to other people. So I'm waiting for for that award, and I would like really to to win that. Wow! Yeah, that's awesome. So I want to ask you and ask uh, the odd uh, uh, person we have come on here. Uh, right now, I'm in the throes of editing my book, and you know, some people love doing it, some people hate it. I actually don't mind doing it. It's just time consuming. How do you actually go about editing your book once it's done? Do you, are you one of those people that let it sit for a while and then you come back to it? Do you jump on it right away? And uh, what's the editing process for you after that? It's like obviously you know, you do it yourself, but you must have other eyes on it as well. What's the process for editing for Dario? Ah, okay. Well, my editing process. It's normally like this. I write all the story and I normally try to put it in an order. I got first into the introduction, the development, the climax, and all, and at the end, the 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 pillow. So the editing process is really, I think, easy for me because I already have pictured the story. I already made when I was a kid and also. 10 years ago, the story. So I, right now, I'm only putting some parts or new parts 
in the story that I already wrote. And that is my editing process. It's really, it's really simple uh, because if the because of my love to, to write less, but to write more about my characters. Hmm. Yeah, my editing process takes forever. <laughs> it, it seems like it's going quick. I ed, I actually edit every day. I, if, I, if I write 5,000 words today, I'll edit 5,000 tomorrow. But as soon as I'm done the book, I'll edit again. I think, Dave, you throw yours on the shelf for a while, do you not? I do, yes. I, uh, I put mine on the shelf for a minimum of a month and do something else and then come back to it so that I can look at it in with such fresh eyes. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. um, so you mentioned, Dario, you, you write for actually a very diverse audience. Um, so could you tell us, I mean, do you find that, uh, you know, that it's challenging to change your writing style for the different audiences? Or does it come fairly easy to? It's really challenging, David, because mm. I, as I told you uh, first in the uh, early, writing in English is really more about the development of the story, I think. And in Spanish, it's more about the character. So, mm -hmm. for example, if I want to write a joke, in Spanish, it's going to be funny, but maybe the English speakers are not <laughs> going to understand it. So I try to, to create neutral jokes so many people can understand it. And also, I try to watch a lot of, of, of American movies, British movies, so I could understand more the humor. Because for example, I think here in Mexico and Latin America, we have a special way of, of writing jokes. For example, there's a phrase in Spanish, no? Call it, que te pasa calabaza, no? It's funny in the Spanish, but you are not going to understand it in English. So mm. I need to write, for example, uh, what's the matter, bro? Or what about this? Or um, I don't know. I can show you the way from the mix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there is different. It's different the process, David. It's very different. And I think that's the cultural shock that got that many people tell me because they say, okay, it's really hard to write in English, but it's also very hard to write in Spanish. One of my friends actually uh, wanted to translate his work and he told me, how do you do it to make it work to the American, to the Canadian, to the English speakers to make it work this story? And I told him, just make it neutral. Write a really good story, and if you want, write some notes so the American, the British, the English speakers can understand that joke. And maybe when they come to Latin America, they can understand that joke. Okay, for example, Dario told me this joke in Spanish is really funny. So when I come to Latin America, I'm going to laugh at that. <laughs> or when they, or when they. Can, are going to come to your country, they are going to understand the jokes that you have. So it's it's really nice, uh, that thing. But also it's really complicated <laughs> because mm. sometimes I, it's really difficult in the, in the writing process, as Richard told. In the editing process, that part is really difficult because how do you do it to make it work and how you can get in the audience to understand the message that you want to, to show. For example, in Hurricanes 2007, it was really easy. It's an action packet story. So it doesn't have a lot of, okay, there's this culture or, or whatever. But for example, in the Three with Young Men, I needed to explain to the audience, what is this holiday about? Because it's similar to Santa Claus in Christmas, but at the same time, it's different. So it's it that is a, that is the 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 thing between the both both languages, David. Yeah, I think that humor must be incredibly difficult to translate because, I mean, even like when there isn't actually a, a language barrier, 
there's there are cultural barriers. I mean, for instance, I'm originally from from England, and English humor is completely different to, for instance, American humor. And like you know, American hu Americans will laugh at things, like in movies and stuff like that. And I'm kind of sat there going, huh, you know, and vice versa. You know, it's like you know, British people will be laughing like, you know, kind of like rolling on the floor and like Americans are kind of going, what, you know? <laughs> and so it's like, I mean, it's incredibly difficult to translate humor between cultures and doing that between cultures and languages just, well, to me, that sounds impossible, but you're obviously successful at it. <laughs> yeah, for example, David, in the case of England, I normally watch it a lot of Monty Python sketches <laughs> so I got to to that because I wanted to to learn more about the the British way of, of pranks and also I my my late aunt usually put Mr Bean on the TV so I I really understood that 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 pranks and also in Canada that you have just for lots on YouTube so I really I'm really I'm really big fan of, of that of that kind of, of stuff. But also uh, here in, in Mexico City or, or Mexico in general, we had a lot of, of Latin, Latin uh, prank shows, no? I don't know if you have heard about Eugenio Derbez. Eugenio Derbez right now here in, in, in Hollywood, he's making a lot of movies, Eugenio, uh, with Jennifer Garner and other actors. Right now, mm -hmm. I think he was part of the cast of CODA that won the Oscars this year. Uh, he's a really famous comedian here in Mexico. And the humor that he normally uh, uses, as a kid, I normally laugh at that. But in the American audience, his jokes are really different. But that, yeah, that's the difference. So I want to ask you, you brought up Monty Python. So being from Latin America and you originally watching Monty Python, did you find it funny or did you find it not funny and i'm not trying to put you on the spot because like david said you know every culture sees things differently and money no. python is kind of an acquired taste or you have to have a lot of uh alcohol in you one or the other <laughs> <laughs> no in this case no richard i understood the, the 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 pranks because as i told you my aunt she normally put a lot of british television when i was a kid so i really got to understand the pranks the jokes yeah. of the of british people not all not all but uh, I really, I really like them, and I wanted to 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 hear more about more different jokes, not only the Latin American ones. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate the cleverness of uh, all different cultures, how they they make jokes and stuff like that, and the play on words and the play on society. It's so interesting to see how different cultures do it. Absolutely. So, uh, other thing I want to 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 mention, uh, Richard, before finishing. Yep. Other things that I really, I think, inspired me were the Nickelodeon shows, because I was a big fan of Nickelodeon. So in 101, Victorious, uh, Karen Valentine from Mariana Grande. Also, uh, I think it was it's The Classified. Many programs from my childhood that really got into me. And in this case, uh, I told you, Disney, Pixar movies, DreamWorks movies were really my 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 favorites when i was working yeah one thing i want to ask you before we uh before we wrap this up and uh, you started writing when you're five or six you said and you've been writing obviously ever since so what kind of advice do you have for someone who's just starting out and they're kind of honoring you know, maybe i want to be a writer I, what, what advice do you have like a simple piece of advice that might stick with them okay my advice to every young writer or not so young writer it's write the story that you really want to have show in the world. Uh, if you have a great story, please showcase your story. And many people will like that. Even, for example, E.L. James created Fifty Shades of Grey, and not many people like that. But at the end, many people also love their story. Mm -hmm. So I liked, I didn't like that as a kid, but many of my classmates really loved that story. So just put the story in the front, in front, and many people are going to really appreciate that. 
I think that's my advice. Oh, absolutely. That's so true. I, I always tell people that uh, as popular as Stephen King and J.K. Rowling and all, Margaret Atwood and all these uh, popular writers are, if you look on Amazon, and you look at the reviews, they've got a lot of negative re one star reviews. You know, some people are haters just naturally, but a lot of them just that's not for them. Like Stephen mm -hmm. King is not for you, but Dario might be. So you just got to find your audience. Absolutely. Of course. Yeah. So I want to thank you for coming on, Dario. I really appreciate it. And I, I think it's, uh, I think I speak for Dave as well. I, I think that's amazing that you've done what you've done already. Mm -hmm. And you're only 25. I, uh, I, my hat's off to you and uh, I wish you much success uh, going forward. And I, I don't think I have to wish you luck because I think you've already got this. So, uh, It'd be interesting to see where you actually are in five years, and uh, let's hope that uh, we see uh, your name across the screen. That would be really cool. Mm -hmm. oh, so, yeah. so, so, what's the next book that we can expect from you, and uh, when is it coming out? Okay, the next book is going to be Brigade DXT. Uh, it's coming this September, and in December it's going to be Latin Dancing. Those will be the next two books I'm going to, to publish. So you've got two coming out this year. Two come. Two are That's coming. awesome. And, and they're going to be in Latin and English, or just uh, they start off in Latin and then you switch them over? Uh, they're going to be in English also. I'm planning to, to translate them. So don't worry. There's going to be wow. a lot of that. But also, normally when I'm uh, doing my trailers in YouTube, they are normally in English, so you can understand the story. And it will be great to, to, to see the to see that working in English. That's great. I don't know if you can see the screen there, Dario, but uh, Wanda saying, great show tonight. You are one cool dude, Dario. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you. And Hillary saying, amazing talent. And I, I totally agree. That's uh, that's, that's awesome. I, I know you've got a great future ahead of you. So, and where can people find your books? They're obviously on Amazon, but do you have them anywhere else or how do we find uh, books from Dario? Ah, well, was right now, it's only in Amazon for the American British people, but in Latin America, if if any Latino is hearing this, it's also in a library in one of the states of my country, call it Pachuca. And also you can write me in my Facebook page. Uh, already, I think uh, Richard uh, put that in the in the in the video i don't know but if you want to reach me out in my social media i'm in twitter facebook and instagram as hurricane dario or uh, as dario aguilar peregrina awesome again thanks for coming on today uh, dario and before we leave I, no go another ahead thing, dario. another thing, another thing uh, richard uh, david and all your audience again if you want to to share your stories or anything, please reach out with me and we can book you in the next programs of Today's Literature or Literatura Actual for the Latin Canadian Radio or also for an interview in Hello Arte programs. So if you want David, Richard to, to be on our, in one of our programs, uh, please reach me uh, or one of your friends. We have a lot of uh, events uh, through the year uh, in the last days, we had uh, an Arts International Congress. So in December, we're going to have a virtual book presentation. If you want to, to present your books, please reach me out and we can book you in the event. It's totally free. So don't worry. You don't have to pay anything. No, no, that's no, that's awesome. I, I definitely will do that. Uh, yeah. I, as soon as I get through these Windwalker edits, which will be within the next couple of weeks, I will definitely uh, get, a, get a hold of you. Thank you for that. Mm. Thank you again, Richard. Thank you again, David. So before we go, Dave, uh, you're talking off air, and I know not everyone's privy to what's going on with your uh, with your writing behind the scenes. But I am. Uh, what's What's the latest in the? I guess it's not really the Joe. Bal I guess Joe Ballin world, but it's more Logan Two Feathers world. What's What's happening? About? Yeah. So uh, I am incredibly close to finishing the third book in the. Uh, in the Logan's World series. I basically have two more scenes to write. I was hoping to get it finished over the weekend, but a few other things cropped up and I wasn't able to. And uh, I'm now kind of like, well, it's kind of 90 plus thousand words now that I've got down. 
And uh, yeah, two scenes from the end, and I am sort of just dying to get to the end and finish it and, you know, celebrate. Nope. <laughs> No what? what do you do now? So you're going to put that on the shelf, and what's happening in the gap? In the gap, I will be writing the uh, next. Um, the what's going to be next? Actually, I'm trying to think. Uh, oh, the next Hyperion Jones novel will be. Okay, uh, I was wondering if that was coming out. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. that will be the next one. That's so, a nice one break for you. Yeah, that will be a, a nice break because there's no kind of realism in the Hyperion Jones book it's just just it's kind of Monty Python's barrier <laughs> it's kind of Monty Python's in space <laughs> so uh, yeah so that's uh, that's what's going on with me um, plus a few other things kind of like personal things but that's kind of like another story so how about yourself Richard yeah no that's awesome I like Daryl mentioned uh I'm um, a guest author at the Fan Expo in Toronto this week, and it starts on mm -hmm. Thursday. And we actually have to drive to Toronto. See, I and it's funny because we we're talking about Mexico City, and I dread driving to Toronto. And it's mm -hmm. I think the population was 2.7 something million for Toronto itself. It's got the suburbs around the which make it a bit mm -hmm. bigger, but it's Toronto would be like a suburb of Mexico City. But uh, <laughs> so I can't even imagine what uh, traffic and everything would be like in Mexico City. So I'm glad I don't have to drive there, but. I'll be driving up tomorrow afternoon to set up my booth at uh, the Metro Toronto Convention Center. And it's right beside the CN Tower and the Sky Dome and everything else. It's going to be a, a lot of fun. Uh, there's going to be a lot of stress, I think, at first, just getting in there and set up. But uh, once we're there, we're there for four days. We're there Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'm uh, doing a couple panels. I'll be on a panel Friday uh, about uh, fantasy creatures and another panel on Sunday, again, to do with fantasy. So. I'm looking forward to that. And Wind Walker is almost 170,000 words now. Normally when I edit, my yeah. book doesn't go up or down. It word count, really, but it's gone up a little bit, and I can see it going up a bit more. So it's, uh, yeah, it's about 670 pages now, and I dread to find out what my printer's going to charge me to print that book. But that's what's going on with uh, me. You, you, you went out of words by now, Richard. I mean, you, there aren't any left. <laughs> yeah, you gotta wonder. You know, I can say she shrugged. Uh, if I say she shrugged like a hundred thousand times, I can really fill that book up. So. I think that's but that's my pet word. Like when I, everyone has this one word that they use over and over and over again. My characters always seem to shrug. So mm. anyway, uh, next week's guest uh, on Lurking for Legends is Lori Schneider from the Writers Happiness Movement. Lori is an author, teacher, yoga instructor, and speaker who has always been enthralled with the places where creativity, science. Ethics and joy intersect. This would be interesting to know where that is. <laughs> I'd like to find it. This has taken her through many careers and fields of study. She has been a marine biologist, an outdoor educator, a dancer, a fourth grade teacher, and a freelance book editor. Since 2015, she has run retreats for writers that offer distraction-free writing time with a yoga chaser. That sounds interesting. Which were the inspiration for the writer's happiness movement? And uh, her middle grade fantasy, The Circus at the End of the Sea, has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize. I'm not sure what that is. I'll have to look that up. She's also a big believer in idealism and the ferocity of the human heart and is the world's best cheerleader for anyone following their dream or trying to change the world. So we look forward to next week and speaking with Laurie Snyder. So before we sign off again, Dario, thank you very much for joining us all the way from Mexico City. I think you're the first person we've had from actually in Mexico when we talked to them. So congratulations on that. You don't really win an award for it, but... Uh, <laughs> Okay, it's an, it's an honor. <laughs> it, it, it was an honor for us to talk to you. So thank yeah. you very much for joining us. Thank uh, you again, guys. See you. So for David, myself, and Christy, who uh, sends her regrets tonight, uh, until we meet again, take good care. Good night.